Anyway, so glad to see you. I am Pastor Steve Gray, the lead and senior and founding pastor here, and so glad you're here and hope that we can get some information back from you so we can keep in contact with you. We hope you enjoy just um, the attitude, not just the service and the music, but just the attitude we have here and um, the freedom we have here, and uh, we hope you'll come back and see us. Um, obviously, it's Palm Sunday, and I'm going to get into that part. It's a, I'm going to put all the pieces together. Um, I'm starting a little later than we like to start, not only just for the time's sake, but just uh, people's um, attention spans have shortened in the last 20 years to about eight minutes. So, <laughs> so uh, get, I, I'm pleading with you to try to focus and give the time out. I'm not going to go wild over it. I'm going to go as fast as I can. But I want you to get this revelation. Some sermons are teaching, some are preaching, and some are revelation, and some are all those things. And I want you to get that today. Also, though, next Sunday is, is uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday, and um, we have our high school band is going to be sitting, I think, right up there uh, with a few extras, like myself, the retired group uh, from band, <laughs> played in band many years. And, uh, but because not all our kids in the high school band could come to our church on Easter because they need to be in their church on Easter. So we have a few fill-ins, and we're going to practice this afternoon, but we're having a lot of fun doing that. The kids, uh, Revive Kids are going to sing, and uh, so it's just going to be a great time, and I hope you'll be here for that. I want to back up uh, before I get into this, and that's why I'm asking for a couple of extra minutes. And you already know this because you experience it every day with your phone or, or on the Internet or whatever. But you all know that, uh, I think you know, that you are, you are already being profiled. You're profiled already, and not only you, but others, uh, of your behavior on your phone or on the Internet or on your computer. And you notice that I've done it too. Uh, I, I looked up uh, a few days ago, I found this real interesting thing about these, maybe you've seen them, these generators that run, don't run on electricity, they have magnets, and it's really cool what they're doing. I thought, I got to have one of those, or I got to make one, or I got to do one. Well, right after I read about it, then since then, in the last few days, I've probably had uh, every day at least maybe 11 or 12 ads for these generators. And so I've been profiled, right? And my behavior that, that this guy wants a generator, and we're going to get him one and uh, make sure he gets one. And so with that in mind, we have to also understand that and this is the bigger picture, it's a very serious picture, is that our nation, and not just ours, but we'll use our, our nation is a nation being, pr behave, our behavior is being profiled. And um, as it's being profiled, though, it's not just, I want to find out about you. And we're probably not that important. There's probably more important people than us being profiled. It's still in the system, but there are people being profiled and behaviors being profiled, and your past is being profiled. And the reason that's unique uh, to our day is now, after they know as much as they can find out about you, or an important person, an important person, then they are going to use that to manipulate our culture and our news and what people are going to say about you. Now, it may... Uh, it may not be true. It may not be true about you or them or whoever it is, but they're going to manipulate so that you come away with the opinion that they want you to have. And I say they, and I don't need to name a name. You know why? Because most of you, if I named the they name, you wouldn't know who it is anyway. These are not people you generally know their names. These are powerful people that are learning how to use propaganda, if I can use that word, propaganda to manipulate the world and us into position into a different America and a different kind of culture. And it's happening so rapidly, I can't, I, I'm trying to keep up with it. Uh, but the, uh, there's a reason I'm telling you that, because it's not part of my sermon. But the idea is a part of this sermon. So I want to get that in you, that that is happening, okay? And, and it is, it just is what it is, and, and uh, so, well, we'll keep going, and then you'll realize why I reminded you of that. All right, so it is Palm Sunday. We're going to combine some things today. Uh, um, I, I went to Mark 11. It's one of my favorites, Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday isn't really a, the best name for it, but they did lay their palm branches down, and that's where it got its name. 
and, uh, but, and they also laid their cloaks down, but Cloak Sunday just doesn't get it, right? So um, anyway, let me give you a synopsis of Palm Sunday from Mark, okay? And I can do this. That's why speed is so important that this part, uh, some of you know, and I can do it pretty rapidly. Okay, so anyway, we get to what we call Palm Sunday. We come to this, and uh, Jesus then is in Bethany, and, he, and he, in, he's going to enter Jerusalem, okay? I'll make this quick. He's going to enter Jerusalem, and you may know the story. Then they go find him a colt uh, and that nobody's ever sat on before, and they say, go, go get that and tell him the Lord has need of it, and they go get it, and then he is outside the city, and Jesus rides into the city, okay? This is typical. It's an announcement. It's a picture. It's an announcement of who he is because this was common then in cities around the world that a conquering king or a ruler or somebody that done a warrior that that did something great would then uh, go outside the city and they'd gather everything up and then they'd make a big announcement here he comes and then the person would ride into the city and they would scream and holler and lay down their cloaks and lay and wave palm branches and sh shout things as a great conqueror all right so this is not Jesus doing this just all of a sudden I'm gonna ride in and they're gonna start singing and saying Hosanna they know what to do and they know what it means when they said Hosanna uh, in the highest, Hosanna is a Messiah phrase. And that means they're declaring him as the conquering king Messiah. Okay? Not everybody in the city is going to go for it, but these people do. Okay? So it's a picture. It's symbolic. It's not new to them. It's new to us. Like we just think Jesus rode in. But kings and conquerors did it all the time. And they would, they would say, he's coming. And then they would run in with him. And they'd you know, celebrate uh, victories. And so it's got a lot of... So Jesus doing this has a lot of meaning to it. All right, so, so let's go from there. So he comes in, and you know they wave Hosanna in the highest palm branches laying down, and, they're, and they're, they're establishing this is the Messiah. This is the king. Got it? So then he's going to ride into, uh, and he's going to go somewhere. I often have told, preached this sermon how funny it was when I was a kid because we got to wave palm branches in the Methodist church having no, you know, and all I'm doing is just smacking my, you know, smacking my brother with it and he's smacking me. But, uh, but, um, but, but we, never, we never knew what was going on. We're, Hosanna, but it's like Jesus is riding into town going nowhere. I mean, what did he do? He, he, he stopped and had a, at a restaurant and then went back out of town or something. That's, you know, I could have made that up, but he didn't. He rode into town and he went to the temple, okay? And when he got to the temple, uh, it says that he just looked around. And because it was late, and I, that's my opinion, it's late because not enough people are there. Some people have gone home, <laughs> so to speak. And so it was late, and he needed, a better, he needed a better timing. So he turns around and he goes back, okay? He leaves. Now, the interesting thing is, so he goes back. Now, what's he got? He's got the whole night. He's got the whole night till the next day. And what does he do? What, what did he go in? When he looked around, what did he see? What did he, what did he process? What was important to him? And then he goes back and spends the night and, uh, and processes what he, what he sees. And then the next day, he's going to uh, go back into the city again. Only this time, he doesn't go in on the colt and go through the parade thing again. He just goes right back to the temple. And he knows where he's going uh, because he was there the night before. He knows what he's going to see. He knows what's going to happen. And he enters the temple. And, of course, if you know the story, then you know he gets very upset. Well, he's probably upset the night before. <laughs> but he's very upset when he goes there. And he turns the tables over. Uh, the Gospel of John, I think it is, says that he makes a whip even. He's waving this whip around, you know. And, uh, and he turns the tables over. And he's screaming. And he's hollering. And he's, and he's declaring. And he declares, my temple. Ah, a key there. This is my house. I'm the king. I just rode in as a king, right? This is my house. My temple should be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers and, 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 and you know, different things like stealing and, and robbers and dishonesty was going on and all that kind of stuff. But you've made it a den of robbers, okay? So he does all that stuff, and when he does all that, then the now to the trigger point, right? The trigger point is the leaders, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, at that point started figuring out a way to kill him, okay? So Palm Sunday is not what everybody's made it. It, it does start out, Hosanna, he's the king, and all that kind of stuff. 
But this is a treacherous, this is a treacherous week. Now, when we get to next week, when Jesus has been raised from the dead, is a whole nother sermon, right? An important sermon. But this is a violent week. Okay, it starts out, Hosanna, but because of what who they say he is, because he goes into the temple and, and acts out who he is. It's his, it's his house. He can do what he wants. And he gives us the opinion. Guess what, folks? God's not that happy about what's going on here. He's not, but God's not. So he's declaring, this is not good. And, and so that triggered them to say they started looking for a way to kill him. So now violence has entered into our story. Because, listen, they're going to get it done in a week. In a week. And this shows you the, the, the way things happen in that one day he's coming in and people are saying, Hosanna, you're the Messiah, but it's going to turn it's going to turn on them, and then one week later, uh, uh, about one week later, people are going to be yelling, kill him, crucify him, crucify him. That's not very long after that happens. It's a violent story, and someone's going to be murdered. It's, it's a, a secret, secrets, and, and, uh, and so how is this going to happen? Oh, somehow, in that short of time, these men must profile Jesus and present him in a false way so that people who are yelling Hosanna have changed their minds and now are saying crucify him. And so the way they did it, the basics of it is, is the way they did it is basically saying we have to kill him because he's going to get us killed. How's he going to get us killed? Because he, he starts riots. Look, he just rioted in our own temple. He starts riots. He's a dangerous person. And, you know, the, the Jews, uh, the Romans, they're not going to put up with this kind of behavior. And they didn't. Any kind of, you know, riot or any kind of thing, they came in rough and, and swinging the swords. And so they've convinced the people in that short time, he's a dangerous person. He's going to get us all killed. You see, this is what happened in, in Germany. A lot of people don't understand that it took some years to convince the German people that Jews were making their lives dangerous. That if we don't do something about Jews, we're going to get killed. They're bad. They're dangerous. And so we've got to get rid of the threat. And by the time they got down to World War II, I was studying about those soldiers who, uh, they, they had a special police force. That, you know you know about Nazis, you know those. But they had a special police force that their whole job was to execute Jews. And so the people, and they would shoot them like they would stand like, six, eight, ten feet away, and bang. And uh, they killed, uh, they shot 1,500 of them in one day, this police, 1,500 of them, and they shot them, and it really affected them in some ways. And then they got hardened to it, right? And, and so they did a psychological study. How can these men do it who had never done this before? And these weren't police officers. These were people that they, they recruited to be like a secret police or a uh, police. And they said, how is it that they could get them to shoot somebody they didn't even know? Some of them even had a conversation with them and then walked over and shot them. And they did a psychological thing. And what they did is they said they got hardened to it. But these men were convinced that the Jews were dangerous to them, dangerous to their families, dangerous to their children. And the solution is we must get rid of them because we're going to be harmed. It's going to harm us. And people, you know, when they get to where it's, you know, they, they want to protect themselves, will do a lot of things. And so that's the psychology, some of the psychology of it. So they were looking to a, a way to kill him. All right, so he goes in, he tears up the temple, he walks back out, he goes out, and there's a fig tree, and, and uh, the next day and there's a fig tree, and he's hungry, and so he's going to eat figs, and he looks on the fig tree, and there's no figs. And so he curses the fig tree and say, nobody's ever going to eat figs from you again. And so that, that happens, and there he goes. And then we, we have, after that, the Temple Mount prophecy, right? And you know that you've heard it like, if you say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, and you do not doubt in your heart, but believe in your heart, whatever you say, you shall have it. And so we can use that, like if you have a mountain of debt, you can use that against that mountain. But the, but the actual saying was, you can say to this mount, he was looking at the temple. And you know what it's called, right? Temple Mount. Even to this day, it's a different temple, but it's still the Temple Mount. 
And so he's looking, he said, you can say to this, let's say it the way he, it would have been said, you can say to this temple mount, be picked up and cast in the sea and it'll be gone. Okay, so all of this is a prophetic picture of what is going to happen to the temple, to Jerusalem, and to the Jews 40 years later. And he would have liked to prevent it. He's trying to warn them. He's trying to prevent it, but, but they won't listen. They won't listen to him. And the reason the general population wouldn't listen to him is because he did not fit the profile that they expected a Messiah to do, and he had been profiled as a dangerous person. That's why when they get down to, you remember, Pilate was willing to let Jesus go, right? And you know, it was Barabbas or Jesus, which would you like me to, to let give as a gift back to you today? And they said Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was not who you think he is. Barabbas has been made historically as a criminal. He's not a criminal. He's a zealot. He loves Israel, and he was committing crimes against Rome in the name of Israel. So he was a, he was a Israel, he was a hero. He was a Jewish hero. And so people get, how could they choose Barabbas over Jesus? Because by the time they got down to, to time to crucify him, people were questioning, maybe Barabbas is our hero because Jesus might be dangerous, you know? And he, he so anyway, so Barabbas gets let go. And Jesus then, uh, Jesus then is prophesying what's going to happen, Okay. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a violent week for him, and it is a prophecy of a violent future, okay? So that's, the, that's really what we call Palm Sunday. It starts out, yay, but you know, then the real story of what's going to actually happen. And so, now, get this. So Jesus, we'll go back when Jesus went into the temple that night, and he only stayed a little while, and then he goes back, and he's going to come back the next day. So what was he doing? When he's in the temple, he doesn't say, we don't know what he said, he doesn't tip over tables that night. What's going on in him? And I believe that he's doing what needs to be done. He is discerning, he's seeing, he's discerning what others don't see. Nobody else is complaining. Nobody else is saying, hey, you know, we really ought to knock these tables over. This is corruption. This is, this is not right. This is not what's supposed to be going on here. Nobody said anything. And he didn't say anything. So I think he was discerning. And what did he do during the night? I think he went and discerned. You know, that word just, he's discerning. God, what are you saying? What am I saying? What are we saying? What are you saying? What should I do? And he gets it. I shall go in and knock, knock that thing apart. I'm going to go knock this thing apart tomorrow. <laughs> right? And, and so he sees what others don't understand. And he discerns it. Okay? How many have that so far? It's just a... It's a quick synopsis. It's too fast, but yeah, got it? Okay. Now, we're going to surprise you a little bit, and we're going to flip it over to 1 John. Now, 1 John is the same John that wrote the Revelation of John. He also wrote um, the book of John, right? It's John, okay? So John writes this in 1 John chapter 4. Now listen to this. I'm going to read it to you in mind of what we just saw and read. Dear friends, do not believe. Let me look at the time. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. You've got to get this. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Now, this is important because you don't hear that very often today. Most people are talking about an Antichrist that's coming, but they don't talk about the one that's already here, which is the same one. It's not his brother. Okay, right? It's the same one. It's already in the world. Already in the world. Even then, already in the world and still is to this day. Now, when, 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 when John says test the spirits to see whether they are from God, normally religion has gone and tested them like in morality, right? It's all moral. But this is not what he's talking about. He's talking here, it's a theological, if you don't mind me using that term, it's a theological testing. In other words, you need to listen what they are saying. Listen to what they're saying. Listen to their, if you don't mind the word, theology, okay? 
Listen, uh, because we need to know who he is. We need to know who he is and the Antichrist. And we need, need to know where he is because he's here somewhere, right? Okay, we need to know who he is. And so he says, test the spirits. The spirit of Antichrist is in the world. So there's two things they need to do, test the spirits. And when they test them, is it, first of all, get it, is this, is what we're hearing, seeing, is it of God? So you're testing them. But then you have to test it here. Is what we're seeing and hearing of Satan, of the devil? Okay, now keep with me. Or is what we're seeing and hearing of God, but what we're seeing and hearing is of the world, is of the spirit of the world. They had to do both. Now, when John is teaching this here, he is not teaching about that's the devil and that's demonic. What happened was this. There, he, he, he's talking about his church. In his church, they had some people rise up, and they began to teach things that weren't right. And the basic teaching was they, they divided us. They said, okay, Jesus was all human. Then another, then this, or they'd say, or Jesus was all divine. And John and his teachings were, you're wrong, because he's both. He's all God, and he's all human. If he wasn't all God, we couldn't worship him. If he's not all human, he can't die for us. He can't represent us if he's just divine. So these people rose up in the church and said, no, 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 he's, he was all human. No, 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 he's, he was all God. And so then when he says the false prophets have gone out into the world, guess what he means? A lot of people don't know this. He means, you can look this up, he means they left his church. They left his church over this theology. And he says, and that, he says, when they get it wrong, when their theology gets wrong, and they get all this wrong, he says, that is the spirit of Antichrist. See what he says here. This is the spirit of Antichrist. They, they, every, they, they went out from us, and they didn't have it. And when he says every spirit that confesses Jesus is, is, is the Christ, he doesn't mean, uh, I just okay, I believe in Jesus. He means you believe in the Jesus, that Jesus is God, Jesus is man, Jesus is divine, and Jesus is exactly who he says he is. He is the Messiah. He's going to return. All, all, the, all the package of Jesus, right? And so you have to believe the whole thing and then act on it by faith. You don't believe it if you don't act on it. Okay, so he said those are the people. And then there's other people that say they believe. These, these false prophets, if you ask them if they believe in Jesus, they say, yeah. But what do you believe? Human, God, what, 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 what? You know? It was real interesting. The other day we had a, I won't say which group, but a group, uh, two ladies came to our door and Kathy answered it and started talking to her about their thing. And, uh, and, she, and they, she, she took over the conversation. <coughs> and they said to her, well, we believe that Jesus, we believe in Jesus too. Kathy looked right at him and says, no, you don't. Right in our front door. No, you don't. You do not. Because see, yeah, they believe in Jesus, but not the one I believe in. Not that the whole package of what I believe that he is who he says he is. He was with God before, and he came to earth, and he came to earth as a man. The theology of it. They believe in, in the person, but not the theology that we, we believe. So, all right. So, what was happening is they were preaching these people, if you want to get in context, what they were doing is they were not preaching immorality, okay? They, they, they weren't preaching sin. They were preaching the world's view of who Jesus is. And he says, that's the Antichrist. That's the spirit of Antichrist, I should say. It's the spirit of Antichrist. They're pre preaching uh, a world view. And uh, so, 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 so when Jesus went into the temple... They're listen to these words. They're buying, selling. There's some corruption. And trading and doing all this stuff. Okay? What is that? Is buying and selling demonic? Or were they being worldly? Right? Corrupt. Cheating people. They cheated the people coming in. It's a long story. But anyway. So he saw. So, so, so all of a sudden it's worldly and it upsets him. And, and worldliness, worldliness inside God's house 
<laughs> I don't know if you're ready for this, but anyway, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> Worldliness inside God's house is the Antichrist. You see, these people were in his church. And they left over this and said, of course, John's church is wrong and all that kind of stuff. And he's saying, those people that left with their theology of who Jesus is and what they're doing is the spirit of Antichrist. And I'll explain that more in a minute. I'm going quick as I can. And, um, okay, so, 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 so when Jesus goes in the temple and they're, you know, he's turning over the tables. He's angry. He, uh, this isn't how my house is supposed to be. And guess what? Nobody else knew what he was doing. In fact, many of them got angry, violently angry. What? Do you think they knew they, as they walked in the temple and there was buying and selling and cheating and corruption and all that stuff? Do you think that they knew what was happening? No. They were witnessing this worldliness. They were witnessing the spirit of Antichrist. And nobody said a word because they didn't know. They didn't know, but Jesus knew, all right? Now, keep moving on. Today in our churches, because here we are in church, and we'll get back to the temple in a minute, but today in our church, we have a problem, and I'm not saying our church as the church, but churches. We have what I would call acceptable worldliness. And acceptable worldliness is the language of the world, okay? Now, what you have to get, get if you're going to really get this right, is you have to understand when John says the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist, he's not talking about a person. He's talking about a principle. It's a principle. It's a system. It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of believing. And why is that so important today? Because we have a whole lot of people that are looking left and right and uh, to find the person the Antichrist when the principle is already here. And we're in the midst of it, and I'm not saying our church necessarily, but, but just churches, they're in the midst of it. They're witnessing it. They're witnessing it and going right along with it. Nobody else turned a table over that I know of in the temple but Jesus, right? And many thought, what is he so upset about? <laughs> What's going on here? And so the, the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist is not a person. And so what we, we have so many people today, listen to this. You want to drop a jaw on this one. Listen to this. Millions of people are looking for the person of Antichrist. But not the person of Jesus. What's the Bible say to do? Watch. 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 Watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray. For who? Not the Antichrist. I, I have nothing to do with him. What? But we, 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 we use that. And people like it. And it's interesting to them. But, but that's, that's not where the problem is. The problem is the Antichrist is already here in our world. And it's not a person because if all you have to do is listen for a person. Because, you know, a lot of people are doing that and they, they're, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. They're looking for monsters to come out of the sea and things like that. Well, I'm not. I'm looking for Jesus to come out of the sky. <laughs> sly, isn't it? Really sly. Anyway, and so John regards the Antichrist not as a person but as a principle. Okay. So I want to see if you can see this. I hope you can. I, I put on my paper here, can you see it? Because I know it might be a stretch. What am I doing? Okay. Uh, okay, example, I've said acceptable worldliness. Oh, my God. I've never preached this before. I didn't even see it, though, yesterday or the day before. As soon as I did, I sat down with Kathy, and I told you about it, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Now we'll just kind of erase everything for a second, on hold for a second. Everybody, including me, we want our churches to grow. Every church everywhere, especially after the pandemic, we want to recover and we want to see our churches to grow. How are we doing? What's the process? So I, I, go on, I went on, online 
and I'm looking what everybody else is saying, and it, it was okay, I get it, and there's some great ideas. In fact, there's such great ideas that I had a little meeting to say, we, we, there's a few things I learned from that that we need to do. We can do it better, okay, and it's going to help. It's going to help our church grow. Okay, so that part's okay, but guess what I saw and what I learned is being taught, especially, and, and it, you know what, it's innocent, it's innocent people doing it because they don't know any better and they're just learning from other people. And a lot of the pastors are, you know, they're 30 years old, 35 years old, and, and they're trying to learn. They're trying to do right. But what's happening in our church today, and you, you, I don't know if you even believe me when I say this, but just like the Internet, churches are now doing behavioral profiling. And that's how you grow. Let me explain it to you, okay? So here's what you do. So you get a visitor or you get somebody you hope will visit. Either hope visit or you get a visitor, right? After you get your visitor or your hopeful visitor, then you need to learn everything you can about them. So you get a card or you call them or whatever, and you want to find out, are they, okay, so, okay, so this person is divorced, this one's in debt. They're divorced and in debt. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, they, they, they have trouble with their children. They've been hurt. They are, they're upset at their last church they went to. Um, and, and the list goes on of all the things, particularly the things that, that are disrupting their lives, hurting them. Um, and that. So you find out all those things about them. Then you build your messages around those behavioral profiles so that you can get the people to nod their head when they're there. That seems innocent at first, and I'm listening to these guys, and they're innocent because they don't know. They're really, I think they're really trying to help, and they're really trying to help churches grow, but they're missing the point of what the outcome is going to be. Because, if, if, and, uh, because guess what it is? It's psychological. It's not spiritual. Me using your past, your profile, your psychology, right, to get you to come to church because I'm, I'm, I'm plugging into that. I'm plugging into Well, that's the same thing that happened now that what the reason I'm going to get one of those generators. <laughs> Somebody out there knew I wanted one. And it made me feel, i got to have that. You know, I want to have one of those. I'm thinking big, like, let, let's think, what, 40,000, wait, 80, how, how many kilowatts could we get so we could have one back here, you know, and, the, and they say, the grid will go off, and well, not us, man, we, look, I got a generator with magnets, <laughs> doesn't cost anything, and, and so, and so what's happening is the church has, the church has used corporate and proven ways to cause people to respond, but they're, respo ugh, they're responding actually to themselves because it's about them. And so you come in and these people get me. And so then you go, then let's go a step further. And then you get a group, get a group of divorced people, get a group of people in debt, get a group of people who have been hurt, right? Those that feel like they've been uh, abandoned, right? Okay, now get a group of them together. And love on them and care for them and show them. Okay, that's good too. I, I, that's a, I don't mind that at all. We'll probably do some of that ourselves. But it's when we get into the, to the real meat of the gospel that we begin to realize God is not here to soothe us. He's here to save us. Amen. See, and when the goal is to soothe but not save, then you lose the power to transform, which gets them out of trouble, and it keeps them, and we become, as pastors, leaders, and churches, we become enablers, because we're not saying there's anything wrong with them. We're not saying there's anything needs to be changed or you need to transform, which is the gospel, but we're, we're just catering to them because we know if I can tap in to their love of generators, they're going to come back, right? If I can tap into their hurt, if I can tap into their emotions, if I can tap into the pain of their divorce, okay, that's all fine. Loving, caring, taking, you, you guys get that part. That part does, you, you that know me know well enough, that's not going to bother me. But the gospel is not that. The gospel is this, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Not what are you going to do, 
Not, Pastor, what are you going to do to make me feel better? Not, what are you going to do to soothe me? What not are you going to do so that when I come back, I always feel better about my life or my home or my kids? No. What do I need to do to get out of this? What do I do? And what was the answer that Peter gave? He says, repent. Repent. You turn, you change, and you'll be transformed so those things go away. Now you don't need a church that's profiling you because that ain't you anymore. Now you're in a church that's already been released from those things. And now we're focusing on not who I am, not what happened to me, but who he is and what he's doing, what happened to him, and what he's doing today. And then the power comes. This is why the gospel of today does not work. It soothes, but it doesn't save. And it's using corporate America, um, political America, all the things that all the big shots are using to profile and then change your minds about politics, change your mind about people, change your mind. Our minds, there's a, a huge attempt to change your mind about what you think about certain things. Huge, enormous, and powerful. And so, and so tapping into that, we already know it works, because I want that generator. We already know it works. But John taught this. This is John's pattern, right? Renounce sin, be obedient, reject worldliness, love, and faithfulness. Right? That's what you do. Okay? And, and so he does that. Okay, let me speed. No, 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 I'm, no, I'm doing okay. I'm going to get through this pretty good. Okay? So... So worldliness then comes, and, and it begins to change our correct view of Jesus. doesn't mean you don't believe in him. It doesn't mean that you, know, you don't love him at all and all that kind of stuff. It's too sly for that. But it changes our focus. And so it's worldliness in a strange way. John says the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Okay, now. When you think of Antichrist, what, what, what kind of picture you get? So you get uh, uh, the Antichrist, and we know this, opposes Jesus, opposes Christ, right? It's opposition. And we kind of look at that, you know, we can pick up on it. Um, we can sit in our churches, and if we, we went to our churches, whatever denomination, it doesn't matter, and, and we, we start hearing a sermon that sounds like, I, I think that preacher, I don't know, he's got a problem. I think he's kind of, I think he's opposing Christ, you know, and he, he's, saying things about the Bible, and you're like, ah, well, we, don't, we don't want to hear this guy. But that's not the best definition. We already know the Antichrist opposes Christ, but I want to help you understand the operation of what he wants. See, Satan does not just want to come and box with Jesus. He doesn't want to fight him. He can't. He already tried. So he's a little helpless there. He's already lost. So, the way it works now in our world and in our day is the Antichrist, which is already in the world, he says, is not blatantly opposing Christ. We would recognize that. But instead, we're going in this teaching, and what it's doing is, so it's not opposing Christ, we go to churches and we begin to hear gospel that helps us put something instead of Christ. Because he's still there. We don't oppose. Here he is. Here, here, here. He's still in my life. He's still in my home. But then when we begin to analyze what's being said it, about us, we now have not. See, the Antichrist doesn't oppose Christ. Oh, well, yes, yes, yes. But he's a little helpless there. But oppose Christ. What he does is he sets us up in a system. And that's what they were saying of instead of Christ. So that means you still got him. But the principles of the whole thing is instead of Christ is a lot different. Because you can have the spirit of Antichrist, of course, without even talking about j demons. All you have to have is, mm, all you have to have is Jesus out of position. 
and Satan in position. And you can still believe in Jesus. You still believe in him. But his proper position, which should be taught in our churches, uh, to position him correctly in our lives, so that like we talked about these children we dedicated today, so they can be saved, we need to make sure they give Jesus the right position in their lives. And so the slyness of it is, is they're all gonna, they all go to Sunday school all over America, and they believe in Jesus, and they, they do all the stuff, but they come away living a life instead of Christ because he's not in the position of Messiah. He's not in a position of Messiah. He is in a position elsewhere. And then we have other things, particularly us, that now have taken that position. You see... What's out of position in today's churches universally is we're hearing sermons that put us in position instead of Christ. Very sly. He's talking about people. Oh, by the way, yeah, um, yeah I already said that, didn't I? That uh, he's, he's, uh, when he says, believe not every spirit, do you understand he's talking about people? He's talking about people. The people are the false prophets, and the people left them, and the people are teaching the wrong thing, and they're giving the wrong position. See, the position of Jesus should be what? He's all God. He's all man. He's all everything. He's on the throne. We follow him. We serve him, right? Obey him. All those things. That's the position. And they reposition him then to no, not have that position because if he's not all God, then you don't have to give it to him. Right, and and uh, and so so it's out of position. So it's a worldly position. Listen, I'm almost done. How about that? <laughs> I'm, it's a worldly position that is very sly, that will keep you in bondage, and will then allow people to profile us, so that we stop listening to Jesus, because we're we like what we hear about ourselves. We're profiled. They care about me. They have a group for me. They have a home group for me. They have friends. I have friends there. We have fellowship there. We, me, me, me. It's all about me. And so what it is, is it's, and it's happening everywhere. And, and I want to say it one more time. These are not bad people. These are good, honest, wanting to, really wanting to do good people. But they don't know. They haven't heard. They're young. They have not heard years of sermons of, of, of the position that you live where Jesus is here and you're someplace else. You're not there. And they haven't heard that. And so they think that, um, they think that the, and this is happening everywhere, they think that the gospel is really humanitarian, not spiritual. Nothing happens in your spiritual. You just get kinder, nicer, humanitarian, and you get along better, and Jesus blesses you, and life is better, and you're a good person, and we're better people than people, <laughs> the other people or whatever. Okay, but it, it, it doesn't matter. If he's out of position, it's the spirit of Antichrist. The, um, I've got to find my place here. I had a line here I wanted to read you. Let's see. It is a worldly position where people lead instead of Christ. People lead. It's people led. It's people uh, based. It can be not always on our hurts and stuff, but just people lead according to their own feelings, what is right in their own eyes, what they feel. It's all about their feelings. So the spirit of Antichrist then comes in and takes the position of Jesus in your life, and now he's there, not as a demon, but as a theology. The theology is me. God is here for me. The gospel is about me and for me. So it, it acceptable worldliness believes in Christ, but will, this is a good one. Acceptable worldliness believes in Christ, but will not give him the position of Christ. Right? Now think of just a second. I'm almost done. Think of a second, though, of all the churches that could be meeting everywhere across our country right now where no one 
well, not many, most are not going to be challenged to give their life away, to die to themselves, to become a servant, to become obedient. They're not getting the gospel that these first century people got that made them so powerful in, in God because now they're going to go and see that all I have to do is give, le- is take the position that God loves me and I'll take that center position and instead of Jesus being the center of our lives, then I am there instead of Christ, me. And it's everywhere. And you, if you haven't ever heard this before, which I can understand if you haven't, but you should check it out. I think when you go and you start listening on the Internet to things being preached and taught and how to build churches and how to do ministry and all that, you start getting it. Oh, they just told me to profile people. Then go minister to their hurts and their desires and their disappointments, and they will come. And they will give, and you'll grow a magnificent church. But that's not the gospel. Not even near. It is all about you instead of Christ. And then, so what do you do about it? You better get a what do you have to do moment. You just basically, it's a revelation. It's a revelation that, that says, that's me. I am the instead of Christ. I believe in him. I love him. But when it comes time to decisions and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to serve, I'm always thinking of me instead. Well, that might cost me money. That might inconvenience me. That may not be what I want to do. And all of a sudden, thy will be done is gone. Because it's my will be done. And I'm going to do it. I'm talking about most people. I'm going to do it no matter what you say. Because I am the instead of Christ. Even though I believe in him. And these people in this book, they believed in him. But they did not believe in the position of him. They did not give him position. So, 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 so what happened to Jesus? What happened from the days riding in and they're going, Hosanna, Hosanna. And not many days later, he's being murdered on a cross. How could that happen? It's because they want a Messiah. They don't mind having, they, they wanted somebody to come and deliver him from Rome. But they did not want to give Jesus the position that he claimed. <laughs> Basically, his position was this. I'm it. No one else. No one else. I'm it. They didn't want to give that to him. They didn't want to give it to him. So, there's no middle ground here. That's the problem. with it. There's no middle ground. You're in either or, Right? And so what we want to, you know, we want to ask, you know, is it possible? Is it possible that there's actually people here that are catering to not, not the devil, right? You understand that? Not to a demon, not to a devil, but to a theology that is antichrist. Because you're in position and you don't plan to step down. When you have marriage troubles, a lot of people do. Two Christian spirit filled, speak in tongues, go to church, wave their arms, and they're having terrible marriage problems. You know why? Somebody's out of position. Now there's a simple solution. Somebody's out of position. Every person, he says spirit, every person that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Well, that's sly because they, I acknowledge Jesus, don't you? That's why I'm here. I acknowledge Jesus. But that word acknowledge doesn't mean that you believe that he exists or he's a good person or even he's the Messiah. You acknowledge his position and you acknowledge it by giving him that position in your life. He's Lord of Lords. That includes you because you're not even a Lord. Give him the position of the Messiah. Because otherwise, it's it's the spirit of Antichrist that wants to take that position. He cannot defeat Jesus, but he can sit in his position. 
in your life. They did not acknowledge the position of Jesus as Messiah. They became worldly and gave the position of Messiah to themselves. And we're pretty much in a selfish, self-centered time in history, right? All about me type stuff. They gave the position that belonged to Jesus to themselves. And it kept them in bondage. It, kept, it did keep demon, demons active, but that's another sermon. So what do you do? Well, what do you do? You just realize the truth. Right? Because he said, believing and acknowledging Jesus is of the truth. If you don't, you're in error. Can you handle that? Can you handle that? Can you go and go away and say, you know what? I've been in error. I'm in error. Because it's really sensitive, isn't it? Nobody wants to be wrong. <laughs> Nobody wants to say I was wrong. We all want to prove we were right. And so, why did Jesus go in and clear the temple on what we call Palm Sunday and do all that? Why? Because he had no position there. And he said, this is my house. And God doesn't like what you've done. It was all about them. They were making money rich. You know, the sad thing about it, and I'm done. It's 12, 13. I'm basically done. But um, the sad part about it is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law uh, were the ones that were going to plan to kill him. And, of course, when he talks about it, he says, listen how sad it is. He weeps and cries over it because he says, he says this is what's going to happen in 40 years. And uh, they're going to destroy the temple. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. And millions are gonna, a million is going to be killed. And he's saying, this doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. You just got to, if you get me into position, you'll stop this thing. And they refused. They refused to give him their position. Now, one last thing. So Jesus goes in, remember? So he goes in the temple. He Clears the temple. Oh, he goes to the temple, and they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. <clears throat> and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law come to him, and they say, do you hear what these children are singing? And that's where the phrase comes. There's, there's different translations, but out of, what is it? Out of the lips of babes comes praise. Is that good enough? Yeah. That's where you get that. All right? But that's not what it's about. Get this. So they go, do you hear what these children are saying? They're saying, Hosanna. They're saying, you're the Messiah. They're declaring you as, as the Messiah of the world. Why is that so important? Why are the Pharisees so upset? Because it was their children. Who, whose kids were they running around the temple? It was their kids. And why is it so sad? Because Jesus says, uh-huh, the enemy is coming. And they're going to throw those children to the ground. You and your children. Some of them will be dead by the time Jesus, uh, by the time judgment comes to Jerusalem in 40 years later. Some will be dead. So it's their own children. They're going to crucify Jesus. But one million people are going to die. They crucified 500 a day. Probably not girls, <laughs> probably not women. Men and boys. Whose men and boys were they, Kathy? If you were at Rome and really angry of what was going on, whose kids would you go after and whose people you'd go after? The leaders, the Pharisees, and their kids. And that's what they did. And Jesus tried to put a stop to it. And it could have been stopped. And you can stop it. In, at least in your own life. We can stop it in our country. We can stop it in our country. The book I wrote, If You Only Knew, is so difficult because people know we have super problems, but people in charge that are doing the profiling and all the money and all that, they don't want to see a revival. They don't want to change America. They want it to keep going the way it is because they got a plan. They have a position that they're going after. They want that position. And I'm writing a tiny little five-chapter book 
saying America is sick and we need to change positions here. But you can do it. And only you can really start it with you. You can bring a degree of favor and grace and safety for the future of you and your children. But we've got to give Jesus his rightful position. We cannot have an instead of Christ. We have to have the Christ in our life. And only, only we have the power to do that. Let's stand up. That's enough. You got it. Imagine that. Imagine people going to church with the spirit of Antichrist. And they don't even know it, Kathy. Is that possible? Absolutely, because they were in the temple with the spirit of Antichrist and they didn't know it. They weren't in the temple going, well, this is the Antichrist, take off your clothes. Let's dance. Let's have an orgy. Let's really, let's really, if we're going to do it, let's really do it. No, they're being as religious as they know to be. You know what they were doing? They're sacrificing. They're doing sacrifices. They're buying sacrifices. They're spending money to buy a sacrifice so they can sacrifice for their sins. That's very religious. But because it was out of position, it was very antichrist. Whew. This is, uh, it, it, I don't expect you all to get it either. Some of the best theologians in the world are going to scratch their heads on this one. This is amazing. An amazing prophetic moment to begin to understand where the church really is. What's it doing to our people for its own benefit to make money, to be powerful? And by the way, I keep saying I'm going to end and I don't. Remember the description of the Pharisees? What did they love? Money. They loved to be seen of other people and they loved to have the best positions in the, count, in the town and everything. Oh, I wonder if there's any similarity to what's going on in our churches today of why people are being profiled with their behavior. And it's not spiritual. It's psychological propaganda. It's psychological, Kathy, propaganda to get them to, to change their behavior and start coming to church and be faithful and nod their heads because they really like what they hear. And it's the same thing. It's the same reason I'm going to buy that generator. Right? They got me. I'm going to buy more than one. Uh, well, actually, I want to build one, but I don't know if I can. But you understand that? The government and, and, and people out of government, more powerful than the government, are using the Internet, and you all have heard about AI and all that kind of stuff, are using that to profile behavior and behavioral patterns. And even today, I don't know if you know, want to know this part, but even today, there are certain profilers, I'll say that, that have profiled behavior, but they also profile the past of people's lives so they can manipulate them with information that they thought no one knew. Huge. This is going on right today. Now, you, the people stand, it probably won't happen to us because who cares about us, right? But certain people, they find out, then they turn it and twist it the way they want it to go, just like they made the Jews out to be the cause of all their problems. Just get rid of them. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to take this word and pierce us with it. If this is from you, then this is really powerful, very truthful, very revelation of the simple things we need to do. But the biggest problem is Jesus is Lord, but he's not in position in our own lives, in our own churches, in our own religion. And we can simply do it. We can do it. We can do it. We needed it. Thank you, Lord, because we needed a revelation. We just needed a revelation to know, oh, I get it. I get what's happening in churches everywhere. They're building churches by behavioral profiling. And we want to do it by spiritual. We want you to encounter the Spirit of God that changes you. So we don't need to have to talk about your past or your hurts or anything anymore. You've changed. You've been transformed. 
That's the gospel. We repent, we repent, we turn, and we change. Not in our own strength. There's a power that gives everybody here a chance to make this truth. And if you can't get it all done today, you can take it home and say, I'm going to start. I'm going to really think about this. Pray about this. Am I out of position or is Jesus out of position? So let's take a moment before we do anything else and just let everybody here and everybody watching from other places really say a sincere prayer. And there's not enough words to describe how great he is or what we should do. But a short prayer from a sincere heart can be a powerful thing. If you'd like to pray this, we want to try our best now to confess Jesus on the throne. Even though we may not be living it out yet, but we're going to know his position. We're going to reposition everybody. So say with me if you want to. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare Jesus is the Son of God who died to take the sin of the world away. He is the only way to the Father. He is the Messiah of the universe. He is the only way to live. I position Jesus. I position Jesus. Son of God. Messiah. Savior of the world. And there is no other. And it is not me. I take a step down that Jesus may take a step up. I enthrone you today in my life and receive the benefits of making Jesus the king of my universe. So the blessings of God, the protection of God, the prosperity of God, all the promises of God that we're missing will come to me, will come to us. The gospel will be fulfilled in us. Salvation will be ours. So, Jesus, you are Lord. I give you my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Take my life and glorify yourself through me. Let me get this truth today. In the name of